everybody i have no intentions of taking more than a few moments because really the students have uh, joined to hear you lord desai from an introduction perspective i don't even need to do that chairman of mda professor emeritus at uh, london school of economics and our very dear own lord desai is here to talk to us about his new book the poverty of the political economy and a really provocative uh, qualifier there how economics abandoned the poor this event is being held jointly with uh, lord desai's alma mater uh, ramdar and ruya college and the leadership of ruya college is represented here dr aditi abhankar dr varsha malavde so i really don't want to stand between the students and lord desai lord desai over to you thank you thank you very much uh i welcome uh, that the fact that i am speaking to people of ruya college as well as the meghla desai uh, academy and uh, as you know as everybody knows i am a i was sort of a student of ruya college i actually mention in my book that i first started learning economics in 1955 uh, in ruya college my teacher there was uh, mr kunte uh, in my intermediate year and one of the people to whom i have dedicated the book is professor gd parik who was professor of economics in my time in riyadh and later on went to went on to become a vice chancellor and uh, i'm i'm very very as very fond of what what he taught us and so on so anyway good to be <coughs> with riyadh and good to be with the meghdan desai academy now what i want to say about this book is that it is a readable book it is not about india it is not about why india will be the richest economy in 19 uh, in in 2047 or anything like that i know in india people are only interested in what india is going to do in economics this is really about a more general issue which is not irrelevant for india but it is uh, as well as well relevant for the rich and the poor countries let me start with an indian example you remember when the pandemic happened when we had covid and the first lockdown occurred what we saw on well, what i saw on our television was people walking from delhi to bihar they walked hundreds of miles uh, to and what did they walk for because they were migrant laborers and being migrant laborers they were away from the native village they could only claim a uh, benefit the manrega benefit in their native village where they were registered as voters so you make the poorest people walk hundreds of miles uh, to get a livelihood but other people are provided for in their own home in urban areas in uh, metropolises and so on and so there is there is a sort of imbalance between the way we treat the rich and the rich and the middle classes and the way we treat the poor and because that was happening in my uh, neighborhood in uk which was not only the fifth uh, richest country but a very high per capita income country i thought why is this going on happening why is the economic sound economic policy uh defined as something in which the rich people deserve income tax cuts and the poor people deserve their benefits being cut giving benefits to poor is a bad policy everybody says we ought to cut their benefits so they will work harder but for the rich people cut the income tax so they will have more money and they'll spend and if they spend money there will be more economic growth in the in you know and everybody will be better off this particular combination of policies which i have lived with much of my professional life i wanted to find out where it came from where did it become economic wisdom to be kind to the poor and tough for the rich uh and so i was confined to my my home during the 
uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic and uh, I had all the books on my shelves. Uh, I have hundreds of books. So I started reading uh, economics, uh, something which I'd always read before. But I said, this is a detective uh, task. I have to find out where originally this idea came from. And so what the book relates is uh, the idea of value in economics. How do economists uh, see the idea of value? And where does it change? So I begin with Adam Smith. And Adam Smith, I know no, most people only have heard of Adam Smith and what they've heard is not very good. But Adam Smith is one of the greatest uh, writers, not just an economist, one of the greatest economist philosophers of all times. And The Wealth of Nations is one of the greatest books you can ever read. Uh, it's, it's a very long book. It's, you know, it runs into two volumes in some cases. It's sort of 750 pages. It's 18th century English, but still it is one of the best books that you will ever read in your life. So do, if you ever get a chance, try and read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations is a very interesting book because it starts by saying the wealth of a country is not in its treasure of gold and silver. Well, how rich a country is not determined by its, uh, its, its uh, stock of gold and reserves either in government uh, um, treasuries or in temples or in palaces. The wealth of a country is in the productivity of its people, productivity of its workers. And workers being the majority of the population, you know, people have to work for a living. So people who work are the majority of the population. It is how productive the majority is, is which will make a country possible. It is not just a question that the person should be busy working. You know, uh, if I may mention the whole idea that, uh, you know, uh, we should all be uh, spinning khadi that Gandhiji had. Yes, you can spin khadi, but the productivity of khadi spinning by hand is very, very low. So even if somebody did spin khadi, the wage is not going to be very high because the khadi he will spin is going to be worth not very much. What you have to do is to give people employment and make them productive. So productivity of the great mass of workers is what creates wealth in the society. And that was a very powerful idea for, for two reasons. One more, one more, it was correct. I mean, it was the best idea about value that you could think of. But secondly, <clears throat> it actually gave people, the ordinary people, the confidence that they were the basis of the wealth of a country. Not the rich people, not the landlords, not the, not the king, but the people who were working and their productivity was the key to the prosperity of a country. And that had democratic implications. Democratic, and we today take democracy for granted because India is a democracy. We have universal franchise. And uh, we have a, a, a voters uh, sort of electorate of a, uh, 900 million, maybe a billion people now. But in the 18th century, when Adam Smith was writing, in the, uh, Great Britain had a parliament, of course, uh, in with the House of Commons, House of Laws, like there is today. But the House of Commons, to which people were elected, they were elected by just 2% of the adult male population. You can imagine only 2% of the adult male population elected uh, people in, in uh, who sat in the parliament. And the people they elected were by and large the children of the people who sat in the uh, in the House of Lords. You know, the Lords were of course people who seriously owned a lot of land uh, and they really were landlords uh, and they were called Lords. You know, I'm a Lord now, but I don't own any land. But this, this is much later. So, and of course, what also used to be the case that if you own a land, some of the constituencies for the House of Commons were on your land. And so you determine as a landlord who would get the seat. 
So they would have to come and pay you money to buy the seat. And, and in one stage, uh, uh, there was a, a, an MP who had only six voters in the constituencies. These were called rotten boroughs uh, and, and pocket boroughs. Now, so democracy was limited, but <clears throat> uh, that was the basis on which uh, discussion began about the nature of wealth, who creates wealth, how wealth is distributed, and so on. What happened in that, uh, that time? Adam Smith was born 300 years ago in 1723. This is the year of the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith. And, and he died in 1790. The French Revolution broke out in 1789. I don't know whether you know about the French Revolution, but you can all Google and find out about it. French Revolution got rid of the King of France and everybody thought there was going to be a, a, a republic. And there was for a while, at least for what, uh, 20, 20 years, 20, 25 years, uh, a, a republic in France uh, where the people uh, took power in their own hands. That led to a panic in uh, Great Britain, just across the channel from uh, France. And of course, France and England were old enemies. Uh, so in France, there were, in Britain, there was a panic that the French ideas would come to uh, Britain. And again, they would also destroy the monarchy and, and, uh, and landlords and so on. So there was a reaction started and <clears throat> It took uh, very many forms. Of course, some people supported the French Revolution, other people opposed it. But at the same time, something else happened. Because of the war, there was inflation. <clears throat> now we are all familiar with inflation. The price of bread went up, price of wheat went up. They used to call wheat corn. So, and the price of corn went up. Now, in those days before, industrialization and capitalism and all that had come. Uh, what we had was a, an arrangement in Great Britain now, where each district, each parish, as it was called, had to look after all the people in the parish. So if somebody was unable to work because they were disabled or they were very old or they had some other problem, the parish would see to it that they would get sufficient uh, resources to be able to feed themselves. Uh, the church, the church collected rates from uh, richer people. The church knew who had the money, and they paid what was called poor rates, and the paupers were fed from uh, the uh, <coughs> the poor rates. But there were also people who were poor but able to work. They were able-bodied people, men we are talking about, and these men were called the poor, but not the paupers. Idea was that the men would be paid wage by the landlord. They're usually working in agriculture. The men, the men would be paid uh, uh, the wage by the people who employed them, farmer or landlord, whatever it was, which would be just adequate for the person to bring up a family. And so there was the worker and his wife and the children, and the wage would give enough money to uh, sustain a family, to reproduce uh, the, the worker's family. High by reproduction meant A, that he could work, day one from one day to next, and secondly, they could take care of the children, which the man the children would grow up. Uh, now, once inflation started, the paupers could be protected because the church would charge a higher rate, collect a higher rate from the, from the prosperous people. And by and large, people were, were good to pay, the, uh, the rich people were paid to the church. But, but it also required that the wage of the worker would go up. <clears throat> and that is where the basically current problem comes from. Because when the idea came, the workers should be paid higher wages through the rates, i.e. what the employer pays plus a little subsidy. <clears throat> Robert Malthus, who was a mathemat young mathematician, he had gone to Cambridge, done mathematics, 
and he was uh, a, a clergy, he was also uh, uh, preaching in a church, uh, and of course he was paid for all that. He basically wrote his essay on population, where he said he could prove that population grew geometrically, i.e. one, two, four, in a sort of uh, compound, compound rates, uh, year per year and population could double uh, within within 25 years. And unfortunately food stuff, agricultural output would only grow arithmetically, one, two, three, four, five. So when it, if you allow people uh, to, to breed uh, children, and of course you breed children because if you pay them more than, uh, more than they need, they will, they will eat more and they'll have more children and so on. So the problem was being poor more led to more children and that meant that you would ultimately run out of, of food enough for the people and therefore very necessary to restrict population growth. And how do you restrict population growth? you refuse to increase the wage of the workers. Increasing the wage of the workers would take money away from the profits of the landlord. And uh, you, you will basically grow in the economy because of the population growth. So the idea that paying anything more to the poor than the minimum necessary is not only uh, bad for the, uh, for the rich who have to pay more, but it's bad for the poor. The poor should not receive more money because if they, if they receive more money, they'll only be irresponsible and, and raise, uh, uh, raise the population. The surprising thing about this uh, is, and I discovered it, and I'm, I'm glad to say nobody else had, had so far discovered it, that this is a completely fake mathematical uh, theorem. He had no evidence for it whatsoever. Even in the contemporary times where he lived in the late 18th century, early 19th century, there was some census estimates of population, but he just made up this fact of geometric growth and uh, arithmetic growth. At that time, the whole idea that you could talk about growth rates, uh, compound growth rate, which we now call which you now do all the time very, very, very easily. It was a new idea. And he cites the uh, Euler's name. The Euler has, has a table of compound growth rates and all that. And so he makes up the idea that England has a growing population and it will double if care is not taken. This was a very powerful idea, especially for the rich. It convinced the people in parliament the rich people in parliament uh, who had to, had to do regulations on these things. And of course, the people who decided poor rich were also among, among the rich. And so the idea came that uh, wages should not arise. Wages should be constant. The iron law of wages, i.e. increasing wages is very harmful to the economy because not only does it hurt profit rates, but it hurts uh, the workers as well, because they, their families grow and, and they, they, uh, they, they will starve themselves. And Ricardo, David Ricardo, who is one of the greatest economists of all times, uh, a master of logic and a great theorist, no doubt, no doubt that he is one of the greatest economists ever. He actually incorporated that in his theory, which is a much more general theory of political economy. And he more or less showed that the important thing is distributing a surplus between profits and rent. Rent goes to landlords, profits goes to uh, the people who are kind of the entrepreneurs, uh, the farmers who are farming the land, uh, and uh, the, the landlords are people who own the land and just rent it out. So the important thing is to concentrate that the profits grow and rent doesn't grow. And, as, and if population grows, then what will happen is the cultivation will have to go on more inferior land and price of food will go up because the cost of cultivation will be higher and therefore uh, uh, any growth of population is bad 
therefore paying uh, higher wages to the workers is bad and therefore we ought to have a constant wages and make quite sure that the profits are are healthy and uh, and, and put in place and ricardo more or less started the idea that these profit this paying to the poor it's going to be so costly and so counterproductive that even if you pay 17 shillings in the pound i 85% taxation it will still not solve the problem of poverty because the poor will just fritter all the money away and 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 inflation will be caused because they'll try to buy too many uh too many in a quantity of uh, uh, to do high quantity of food stuff and so on and we will all be as it were worse off this particular set of ideas has even now ruled economics what my book does then is it examines not so much the economic theory but how the political movement for a wider franchise uh took place in in great britain and i trace that uh, idea from 1832 when the first uh, uh first triumph of uh, uh greater franchise was uh, scored 1832 the total franchise went up from 2% to about 12% and even that took a lot of a uh, lot of fighting in in both houses of the parliament and then steadily from then on till about 19 uh, in the 20th century early 20th century uh, the big the big increase came in the first world war when all men uh, got uh, vote uh, if they were 21 and over and all women got vote if they were 30 years and over and in 1928 all women got vote on the same basis like men 21 india of course adopted universal franchise at the time of independence and that was a great great achievement on part of uh, the indian uh, independence movement now <clears throat> the book then moves on to say that it is only when universal franchise came i mean when the politics changed parliamentary politics changed that people began to talk about how in economics welfare should be measured by how well of the poor are and arthur cecil pigou whose name i sign was the first person to say that it is the share of the poor in total income which is an important indicator of the total welfare of a society and some of you will uh, some of you who do economics would know this thing about utility theory uh, how total utility increases with higher income but the marginal utility declines so utility per per dollar as it were is higher for the poor than for the rich so if you transfer money from the rich to the poor total welfare of the society increases because what the rich lose by way of a dollar or a pound taken taken away from them and given to the poor the poor get more utility than the rich and then i trace how that idea was attacked in in the literature it's actually by somebody called Lionel Robbins who was professor at the London School of Economics and then and that sort of thing went on for a while the second part of that discussion is of course just when we go was changing the nature of economics Keynes came and Keynes uh, also wrote a great book called the general theory of employment interest and money and he said that thing was to have full employment ricardo had had uh, also said that uh, so involuntary unemployment was impossible by the principles of economics you know there's always there's no policy there's no possibility of excess supply demand always equal supply demand for labor always equal supply demand for commodities always equal supply and therefore there is no possibility of unemployment and Keynes of course Keynes challenged that proposition and then uh, of course uh, what was called new economics was born around Keynes and uh, Keynes in theory and of course then i traced the idea that the whole problem of inflation Um, was uh, became became serious in the 1950s 
And from then on, the big debate bit was Keynes right or was monetarism right? Uh, and of course, 50 years of uh, economic debate happened, part of which I have uh, been there to take part in. And what we got in 2008, not, not all that long ago, was a collapse of the stock market, which neither the Keynesians nor the monetaries were able to predict. So at that stage, basically economics, more or less, you know, so there is no one true theory of macroeconomics in here. I believe there isn't. But now can we please stop worrying about all that nonsense and can we uh, redirect our attention to how the lives and livelihoods of the people in any country is the thing by which you measure value. It is the quality of the lives and livelihoods of all the population, which should be a measure of value. And we now have this human development uh, sort of, uh, index, which some of you would know about, in which we, we kind of add up uh, life expectancy and education and income. Uh, and I have tried to propose a slightly more general uh, measure in which what you measure is the number of years each of us has left to live, uh, and especially the number of healthy years of life. So in a younger population, people with a per capita more years to live, in an older population, there will be less years to live. But per capita, a number of years left to live times per capita income, but per capita income corrected for the level of poverty or collected for the inequality of income. So if inequality is very great, then per capita income is not worth very much because most people will not have their per capita income. It will all go to the rich or, or you know, in a sense, uh, you, you, it'll all go, uh, uh, you know, uh, to people who, who always have had good income. So corrected for level of poverty or for what's called the Gini coefficient measuring inequality. So healthy years times uh, per capita income corrected for, uh, uh, for inequality or poverty is a very good measure over the whole economy of the value uh, we, which, which, we, which we should be enhancing or we, we should be measuring welfare of the population by that particular statistic. So that is the idea of the book. Uh, as I said before, most of the book is not mathematical, except the last chapter, which sets up the index. But even that last chapter doesn't use any mathematics, it's just sort of simple equation which you can, which you can uh, easily understand. Anyway, if you are at Ruya College and studying economics, I, I, I can assume that you know that one because uh, students of Ria are clever. And of course, students of Megdad, they the academy are clever. If they're not, why are they there? Uh, okay, so I have now given you a, a flavor of what the book is about, and we can talk about different aspects of it as you ask me questions. So here I will stop and I will ask you to ask me questions. Thank you very much. No, no questions. Uh, uh, sir, Aditi here, uh, we have asked, uh, told the students, they must be overwhelmed with your talk. Uh, let uh -huh. them gather their thoughts, put their words together, and they will ask uh, questions, sir. Why don't you ask a question? I, I have read the book, and yesterday I glanced through the book once again, sir. It was a very enlightening experience. I have known you Thank for you. last uh, more than a decade now. Thank I you. know you very well. And therefore, all that your and you know all your writings in last uh, you know around three four decades I have gone through. So it was again a very uh, you know interesting thing to read and getting a kind of a new insight into what is going on and you know post COVID how you have put up. I was telling Varsha today in the morning like Adam Smith and Pigu, you know these two 
things to be connected and then looking at the whole thing from a new perception new point of view after the pandemic it was really yesterday only i read it once again i mean i glanced through word to word reading was not possible now i will slowly read it so sir it is really you know now all that we talked about currently it, uh, we are in a confused kind of a state isn't it don't you think so that are we looking forward or is it the is it oncoming of recession we had high inflation unemployment so what is it what are the currently how do we look at the situation post covid this is my first thought that like came to my mind after reading yesterday okay uh, i i take the view that what we are going through is uh yeah, inflation and likely recession uh what's called stagflation and i also having lived a long time i recall that this is exactly the way the economy was uh behaving in the 1970s and 1980s now it's very very long ago for most people but the whole word stagflation was invented only in that time because in the earlier 50s and 60s we thought you either have full employment or you have unemployment we never thought very much about inflation but if there was inflation then the idea was what's called the phillips curve that if you increase if the government can do some increase of unemployment then inflation will die down that that was the idea the phillips curve was done by a man called phillips who was a professor at london school of economics i even uh, i even worked with him personally he's a very nice person anyway in the 70s we had inflation and unemployment so we had been, we, we tried to uh, kind of deal with that peculiar problem and it it took a lot of damage to the whole economy the, the the indian economy was in a very bad state in the 70s uh it got a little bit better but it really started growing in 1990s but right now we are sort of going through that but india seems to be so far in a good situation because my explanation of that is that when the world is looking for investment opportunities uh when well, because china is slowing down and so on uh they look at india and they say well you know here's a billion people even 20% of them were well off that is 280 million people in a we are 1.4 billion one fifth of that is 280 million people and that's a very large prosperous economy so it's kind of goes against my idea that you really ought to look at redistribution of income here without redistribution india is gaining a lot of flow of investment from abroad and india is very good at digitization and financial technology and i'm sure it be very good very soon in artificial intelligence because you know india is really good not so much at manufacturing but at its digital services and and you know sort of uh, computers and all that so i think while while the government wants to have manufacturing here and so on we, our agriculture problem is solved and now i think india may be able to avoid this recession actually the imf or the world bank is saying that india will be the fastest growing economy and it will help the world economy we will see that that is true or not but i by and large think the world at large is going to suffer a serious bout of inflation and recession now that will affect india but maybe not immediately but that is not part of the book that will have be have to be a next book Oh yes, sir. That's really great. Well, uh, students and uh, my teacher colleagues and uh, other faculty members, let us put it open for everyone. Students, to please do not hesitate uh, to ask a question. Interesting question. Uh, I think Lord Desai. It's from Ananya, who's a current student. Okay. She says the book has a premise that inequality has increased exponentially over the years. However, she believes researchers like Hans Rosling have shown that median incomes have converged and millions have been lifted out of poverty. So she believes the, the premise needs to be updated. So she is questioning actually what you have said. 
Well, I I don't actually say that inequalities increase exponentially. You know, I'm you know, I'm not Piketty. I'm not Thomas Piketty. Uh, I what I say basically that in order to measure welfare of a society, if there is inequality of income, we ought to correct. We shouldn't just say per capita income is a great measure of welfare because not everybody gets a per capita income that we, we measure. So let us see whether we correct per capita income for say one minus the inequality measure or one minus the poverty measure, which will give us a better account of more or less on average what the people will actually get. So per capita income is not a good enough average. You have to correct it. Now, inequality has grown. I mean, there is no problem, there is no doubt that between 2000 and 2020, across the world, uh, inequality grew. Now, I'll give you an example of this. In 2008, when there was a huge stock market crash, what happened? Governments and central banks across the world started printing money. They've all been saying, oh, printing money was bad, it ruined invest money. But once the banks went bankrupt and insurance companies went bankrupt, governments printed money, put the interest rate down, bought the debt of uh, companies and so on. And basically money was given to the rich to restore their fortunes. At the same time, they did not do the same thing for the poorer people. They did not increase basic income or or unemployment benefits and so on. So by and large, increase of inequality has been rather sharp in the first few decades of the 21st century. I, I, I don't know the I don't know the evidence this uh, student uh, cites, but inequality increasing or not increasing is not my problem. But there's no doubt it has increased, and uh, it'll take some time for that inequality to come down. We, we would need positive policies to uh, diminish inequality. And we don't see a sign of any of that. Okay, we have uh, one more student, Sudharmati so, Konar, asking you whether he, he, he enjoyed your book. So can yeah. you recommend more books uh, written by you, which are your favorites? Oh, wow. Uh, no, I, I've written 50 books. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say, but uh, one one book, uh, well, one book might be very good for them to read would be on, on India, either Rediscovery of India or a book called, uh, um, oh God, what is the book called? Uh, the Raisina, the Raisina model. The Raisina model is a model about the nature of Indian democracy. How uh, Indian democracy is not the Westminster model, but it is, India has created its own model of democracy, which takes care of the Indian situation. Uh, so that, uh, but if he, if he wants to do, make his life more difficult, he can read a book called Marx's Revenge, which is all about how communism uh, declined and capitalism survived against all the things that uh, you know, people like me used to believe in our in our uh, teenage years, we thought communism will triumph and capitalism will go away. History has been completely so. Those those three books are are they, they can read any uh, any of them. I've also written a book on cinema. If you want to read, read a book on Dilipkumar, so you can read a book on Dilipkumar. So I have a question, Lord Desai. Yeah. So I get it that two centuries ago, the aristocrats had their own lo warp logic for why the poor should not be paid more. Yeah. But am I mistaken when I make the observation that at least in India, mm. those who get lifted out of poverty and enter the middle class, then start looking at the poor in the same way. Of this course. is my firm observation in India. Is this a global phenomenon? You know, basically uh, it happens everywhere. Once I have gained my, my foothold up the ladder, if I go to the top, I want to throw the ladder away. <laughs> but I certainly am not going to help the people below me to come up. Mm -hmm. It is a human instinct, you know, 
you for if you if you're aware of what happens in India, you go and go help your cousins. The family, the large, the family gets larger and larger, and you help your own family. You very seldom help strangers, and you complain. You see, every time there's a budget, only thing you are interested in middle class is how the income tax been cut or not. When I'm always very amused, the, the budgetary discussions are about, oh, has has the FM cut income tax or not? And if, if she has got income tax, everybody is very happy. Who is happy? I'll tell you what. Think of India as, as I said, 20% rich, 40% middle class, and 40% sort of below that. I wouldn't call them poor because then we get into definitions. So the 20% are American style standard of living, 260 million people. The, the 40% are sort of well off you know, Asian standard of living. And the bottom 40% are Indian, uh, you know, Indian poor. Now, you know, India is an astonishing, you know, when Air India orders 300 planes or whatever it is, you know, you say, it's a whole different scene now because the, the population is large and enough people are rich. But we should not be fooled by that. We should always remember that there are 40% poor in India. And those 40% are 500 million. Uh, and and we, we ought not to forget that. Uh, Varsha, go ahead. Uh, I think you have a yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Lord Desai. This is Varsha from Ruya College again. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I haven't had an opportunity to go through your book, but then what you were talking about actually has... Uh, a curiosity uh, kind of aroused in me. One, when we are saying that the poor and particularly the uh, working class has been uh, kept to the dismal state uh, due to uh, low wages, is are you kind of crediting it to the intellectual incapacity of uh, the political economist or you are possibly looking at the nature of the science itself, I mean, nature of the branch itself called political economy to be actually dismal in nature, or you are actually uh, looking at the poverty or incapacity of uh, the, uh, the political and economic institutions across country to address uh, the workers' status. Well, you know, in a sense, in one old fashioned way, I'm saying it was the class interest of the people who were writing economics at that time. Uh, they, they, they were, the people who were writing, both Malthus and Ricardo, were not poor. Uh, Ricardo was one of the richest persons of his time. He was a banker and a great stock market uh, uh, sort of operator. And he actually bought a seat in parliament in which the a seat had only six voters. So he became a member of parliament uh, and by, by buying a seat. But the thing is, you know, I think, I don't want to put it crudely. They were facing a problem, a political danger at that time. It looked like the French Revolution would come across, the whole system would be destroyed, the mob will take over, the poor people will, 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 will they will remove the king and so on, like the French had done, and they felt threatened. But even so, the way Malthus or Ricardo write, it is very dispassionate. You think, you know, the very clever people, Ricardo is especially very dry, very, and so you think, you know, this, you know, all these years, people have always thought what a clever man Ricardo is, what, you know, Malthus is more controversial. Now, Marx, for example, loved Ricardo because you know, Ricardo was dispassionate, you know, he was not interested in defending his own class interests and all that. I was very surprised when I, and I've read Ricardo before, I had not read with this particular angle. And I was surprised by Malthus, for example, everybody concentrates on the population chapters and so on. But in Malthus, as I say in my book, there are four chapters criticizing poor rates, you know, and those four chapters are never changed in successive editions. He basically wrote that book to criticize the whole system of poor rates. So he was against welfare state being set up at all. 
for the poor. Now, thing is, here are two comfortable young people, very intelligent, there's no doubt about that. These really are fantastically intelligent people. And they wrote something which then became an accepted truth. We people didn't even have to think about it because it's a logically so beautiful. They everybody thought, of course, Ricardo is right. Of course, if population goes up, you know, prices, prices, uh, the marginal cost will go up of growing corn and, and then, you know, uh, wages would go up. And it became sound economics because people who were making economic decisions for a long time were relatively rich people. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't want to be crude Marxists, but we have to know that the economics was shaped by the people who had political power at that time. And so without, without making sort of too much kind of rhetoric, uh, fancy about it, I'm saying you had to have a change in the political power distribution, not so much economic distribution, but political power distribution in terms of the voting rights, which actually changed the economics. So it is not a crude Marxism, but it is in fact a different way of, it's distribution of political power, a formal equality of voting power, which made a lot of difference to the way economists began to think about the world. And that, uh, nobody else has argued that. Sorry, go ahead. But, uh, no, I then uh, what basically comes to my mind is then, the minute you start talking about institutional economics and the importance of all institutions being highlighted, does that improve uh, the way um, you know uh, economists have started looking at uh, the underprivileged classes, uh, including the class of work? Because yeah. then you have ideas of institutions and inclusive development. All these can sound better as compared to uh, the earlier ideas. <laughs> no, it... I, I, I know there's institutional economics and all that. I'm making a, a different sort of argument, which is yeah. not to my knowledge been made before, which is, you know, normally people say that, oh, economics determines politics. You know, Marx, Marx obviously uh, mm -hmm. sort of made this very popular. Uh, I'm saying at least economic theory, the way it was written, was more determined by the political structure of late 18th century, early 19th century Britain, which was more or less like what it ever else. And it was the class interest of people who are both economists and parliamentarians and landlords, who in a very objective, dispassionate way, seemed to be saying, well, this is a universal truth. I mean, Ricardo at one stage says it is as much uh, a truth as a law of gravity, that you know, if you pay the poor more money, it will be, uh, misused. Now, the fact that they could do that, and they're genuinely, obviously, honest people, they thought they were doing what, what uh, saying what was correct. It took me, everybody else, and all these people, and it's only the pandemic which made it clear to me. I have to say, I, I myself had not seen it, but the pandemic made me think very hard about why is economics in such a bad, bad situation. And so I'm proposing that it may have been the political nature of distribution of political power, and the nature of distribution of political power, which was determining economic orthodoxy. Now, that will, I'm sure other pe people in the future will write, you know, uh, term papers and essays and PhDs testing whether what I say is true or not. Is this true of every other country? or was there more progressive economics possible without universal franchise? I mean, that would be a, that would be a hypothesis. Now in India, we always had universal franchise. We still don't have progressive economics, but that's another story. Uh, it, it is necessary, but may not be sufficient. But so I'm, I'm raising a question. Thank you, thank you, sir. I, it's an amazing tenet that we all would start working on. Thank you for that, thanks. Absolutely. Chaitanya has a couple of questions. Chaitanya, I've yes. asked to unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question, Chaitanya. Okay. Uh, okay, sure, sir. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Yes. If you speak up, you're audible. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. So my first question was that 
post covid pandemic uh, can we have a positive integration of the circular model of economy for sustainable employment generation i mean always I mean, COVID has no no relevance to it. There's all the circular model of the economy is basically what you get is what you spend, and so the money comes back. And there is no other model of the economy. Uh, so I I don't know is there something more specific you want to ask because the circular model of the economy more or less says demand uh, you know if you if you pay people money uh, they will spend it and then it will get back into the economy generate employment. And those employed people will also spend their money, and so it'll it'll turn around. So to that extent, the circular model of the economy is basically a matter of fact, and it, it determines total employment. Keynes Keynes told us that, but it was known even before that with, with Adam Smith and uh, so on. So circular model of the economy is is universally true. Now whether it generates employment or not may depend upon other smaller factors like. Taxation and incentives and so on, but yes, circular model of the economy does generate employment. Now, there are, as I said, there are other problems like the environmental effects and so on. Depends upon what activities generate the supply and how is demand catered for from the income which is received by by the the workers. That that and that's what we economics is all about. Unless I have missed your question, that would be my answer. But if I missed your question, you can ask again. Okay, sure, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the response. I just wanted to uh, get to a follow up that can like currently in the uh, in the country we like we do not see that much uh, encouragement to this model of economics. And what is your opinion on which model of economics? A uh, circular model of economics. Chetan, I think you are talking about sustainable. Uh... But there is only there is only circular model. There is no other model of economics. You know, I mean, this basically demand demand and supply are two sides of the same coin, and sometimes demand may fall short of supply, or supply may short fall of demand. The very cure it is against them to match. Are you worried about the environmental effects? What are you worried about? Yes, sir. Why? Sorry, I realized my mistake. It. Uh, I wanted to suggest the green uh, model of economics. Oh, the green model. Well, the green one. Green one is basically, in my my view, is that uh, uh, while there is inequality of income in the world, the poorer countries want growth, and the rich countries want a better environment. But until the poorer countries are compensated to, you know, either to give up growth and live off the surplus of rich countries, uh, it is going to be very difficult to suddenly go to a green. You know, the poorer countries are not going to give up growth just to improve the environment. Uh, th this has been a constant struggle. You know, I've, I've been following this uh, green thing since the 1970s. The first uh, uh, conference I remember was in Stockholm in early 1970s, where the slogan was "One week to save the world." I mean, we have had one week to save the world forever. After that, so I think the problem of the green uh, uh, agenda is that there is no congruence of economic interest about the green policies. So what what will happen is very slowly. And I'm not discussing that in my book. What will happen is very simple. First, the technology has to change. Like, for example, now we have electric vehicles rather than petrol uh, burning vehicles. That will reduce pollution. There will be other, let's say, we, we will insulate houses so that we don't need to heat them, at least in the colder countries. And, and then, of course, prices will have to change because we will have to uh, make people pay for pollution. If, if they're polluting, you'll have to pay for pollution. Now, Pigou, whom I mentioned in the book, is actually it mentions these sorts of policies in his in 19, 1913 book. When he was aware that there is a problem. And I think economics is very much engaged on this issue. 
and you require appropriate taxation policy and so on. So, so yes, it can be done, but I don't think there's a simple global solution because the globe doesn't have a common interest. People think they have because the, the environment is common to us, but that is not enough. We still need some common economic interest in which the poor are looked after to afford the rich better climate. And the rich are not right now willing to pay. And therefore the poor are not willing to give up their, their coal burning. Uh, you know, as, as proved in the Glasgow, China and India said, you may do whatever you like about your coal burning. We need our coal burning to get lost. Now that was a very, very straightforward illustration of how the poor and the rich think differently about the environment. And that's the way we think about everything else. The poor and the rich think differently about the economy. We would like them to think in a correct way, but there is no common interest like that. That's politics. Agreed, sir. Thank uh, you so much for that. Uh, uh, moderator, Mr. Moderator, yeah. sorry. Can I ask further question? Or? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't, don't waste time. Yeah, ask me the second question. Quickly. Okay. So my second question was that last year we had a report, an inequality report that came in that uh, it said a person having 25,000 rupees monthly income is part of the top 10% of the country. So with, uh, in future, can we make these figures more just uh, with economic reforms? Inequality is not going to reduce. Don't worry about that. Uh, inequality, I mean, as we were just saying a while ago, inequality actually increased even in rich countries uh, in, in the first 20 years of, of this century. Uh, you know, yields fell you know, because governments were, were, were making policies which were called quantitative easing and so on, which uh, depressed the yield rates and it passed money to the, to the, to the asset owning classes. And so inequality is increased uh, in the world. And so inequality is not going to come down uh, anytime very soon. And India also has chosen a path that basically uh, right now India is uh, growing because there's a massive inflow of capital investment from abroad. And that's people who are very rich abroad want to make a better, better return on their income. And India is a good place to invest in. So the economic right now, India is benefiting from that kind of stuff. I think inequality is very difficult to reduce. I have, I have, you know, uh, I've had colleagues who spend their time on it. For about 50 years, between 1930 and 1980, there was uh, a, a, some reduction in inequality in the rich countries. But you see then what happened in the 1980s is when they were fighting stagflation, they decided that tax cuts for the rich was the answer to, uh, to for, for growth, like I was saying to begin with. And in, in UK right now, there's still a big debate going on how soon is the government going to cut the income tax for the rich? I mean, the whole thing is, uh, uh, you and I may think inequality is a bad thing, but the people who have the money don't think that. And therefore they are going to resist any, uh, any uh, reduction in inequality. Inequality is very difficult to reduce. Poverty is easier to reduce, but inequality is very difficult to reduce. So here's Sorry. what I think is a common sense question from a student. Okay. So I think the student seems to be saying that we can all agree that economics has abandoned the poor, but the yes. student seems to believe that the way economics is studied and taught, it just assumes that this is not true or it, you know, it is just blind to this fact. I know. Well, the, the, the thing is, you know, uh, we don't actually concentrate on these questions. We learn economics, basically, we learn how the circular flow works. You know, that the basic e economic understanding is how does the circular flow work? How do demand and supply match each other and the outcomes of unemployment, the unemployment effect, and so on. And that is itself is a very difficult thing to understand. Because most people don't understand that sort of thing. You know. uh, so I think there is, of course, at a higher levels of economics, study of how to reduce inequality and so on, and progressive taxation and so on. 
But the whole case of progressive taxation has been lost. What I have noticed over my lifetime is when I was in Ria College, we all believed in progressive income tax and the highest level of income tax was 80 to 90%. Now everybody says, oh, no, no, you must do that. Income tax must be such that to give incentives to the rich people and so on. So I think the, the battle of inequality, has reducing inequality has been lost, at least for the time being. Another generation may do better, but I don't think that there's much hope of that. Sorry. Asha Gala has again a very relevant and I think common sense question. She says, yeah, given all of this discussion, we look at the current, the recent budget, Indian budget, and it gives preference to capital expenditure over social expenditure. So, you know, how do you view that? Well, you know, that is a constant in in uh, Indian budget. You know, it was it was the same thing in uh, uh, from from 1947 onward. You see, for example, our spending on health and education in India is very meager. You know, compared to compared to you know machines to build machines and and infrastructure development and all that. You know, lovely in lovely big uh, water, uh, river river uh, uh, irrigation schemes and so on. Now, you know, in a sense, bad choices were made early on because India wanted to industrialize very rapidly. And idea that literacy mattered, good health mattered, uh, you know, good housing mattered. And all those things actually increase the welfare of the people and may even contribute to economic growth. That logic has not been made clear in India. It's not been made clear anywhere else, but the idea has not been made clear that if you want to improve uh, uh, growth, improve the quality of life of the people first. And if you give that a priority, you know, you may, you may get good results in terms of people's welfare. So one of the things I'm trying to say is, suppose you measure your, the achievement of your economy not in terms of total GDP, not in even terms of per capita GDP, but this combination of lives and livelihoods, you may suddenly realize that you're not doing as good as you think you are. You know, we, we, we are not actually taking care of people's health and, and, uh, and inequality. So, so my message is measure total welfare differently the, the, the numbers are all there, and you may realize that India and the whole world is not doing as well as it thinks it's doing. Okay. Chetan, you have one more question? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much uh, for recognizing me again. Uh, and uh, yeah, the question is regarding digital technologies and its impact on the economy, on the Indian economy specifically. Because uh, digital technology has uh, restructured the traditional uh, traditional economic structure we have for the good and the bad. So in future, what do you think it might do? Well, digital technology has been the really one big blessing for Indian, Indian economy. Uh, you, in, uh, in 1991, when... Uh, the Narasimha Rao and Manmohan Singh governments came to power and they liberalized the economy. Uh, at that time, it was basically the, uh, the as it were, Infosys and things like that. Now, the interesting thing about digital technology is that you can export labor without geographically moving. That's one of the great, what happened in India, what happened was a middle, in India, traditionally for the last 300 years, the poorer people have moved from Bihar and UP to Mauritius or to Caribbean and so on. They, they went to, to be sugar plantation people or coffee plantation people, or they went to Malaya and so on. What happened in 1990s is that the IIT graduates sitting in Bangalore were able to service American companies online. And so that internet was one of the greatest beneficiary for the Indian economy. Uh, internet was not invented for India, it was invented for the US Cold War uh, policies, I won't go into that. But the fact that you could 
you could uh, export the profits, uh, the, the products of skilled labor long distance without having to actually physically travel gave a tremendous boost to the Indian economy. And I think the Indian economy is a kind of rebirth, I would say. 19, 1991 onwards, Indian economy moved to a bigger, bigger uh, step. And once more, it has maintained that big lead in digital technology. If you read today's newspapers, even the World Bank uh, president mentions how India has done very well in the digital, digital technology. I mean, for example, what, the, what India has got in terms of uh, financial technology, you know, when, when you make payments, India is far ahead of what, what UK is in. I mean, I'm, I'm astonished every time I come uh, to India how much people can pay online and so on. And the degree to which you save transaction costs is fantastic. And what's also very important is, you know, and I, I've always said it, the reason why the, the, the places like Infosys, as people who are in this uh, sector, actually grew, is that the planning commission at that time had no idea about this. They were still worrying about old fashioned steel industry and, and, and machines and so on. Luckily, because it was not being regulated by planning, it grew. Had it been regulated by planning, they would have banned it or something. Uh, I remember when the first discussion took place in Lok Sabha, when uh, MP had heard about uh, computers, 1960s, they say computers should be banned because they'll take people's jobs away. Uh, seriously, in the, everybody was saying that. And they were stopped from uh, doing that because the government uh, wasn't going to agree. But I think digital technology has been the great weapon India has been able to use because what Indians have is a capacity for abstract thinking and digital technology requires abstract thinking. And Indian, Indian students, Indian young people, men and women are very good at that. And IITs and IIMs, and, and now they're running uh, you know, multinationals in the US. So digital technology has been the great savior of the Indian economy. Um, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Amlesh, why their out uh, hand is up for a long time, and okay. Chandra Mohan also. Yeah, yeah. So yes, hi, sir. It's why they this side. I have a very uh, small question with respect to particularly you spoke about the French Revolution. So, in sync with that, our Indian Economic Survey, which uh, speaks about the Bayesian techniques to uh, deal with the pandemic, particularly. So, how if we can and if we can, how can we use Bayesian techniques or Bayesian analysis uh, to deal with power, poverty post, like post pandemic? So I don't know what the uh, connection of the French Revolution is, but you know the thing about uh, the pandemic, uh, and which is not just an uh, India problem, but uh, all across, is that the pandemic, in a sense exposed that the people losing out or from any economic shock are the same people. And like I said, the women, the elderly, the migrants, the immigrants, uh, and the people of uh, not the majority race, but, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, foreign uh, races and so on. And this is, the, the lesson of that is actually accommodate to the shocks felt by the poor people. And as I was giving in 2008, when the stock market collapsed and banks went bankrupt and the rich men uh, lost money, the government, governments across the world opened up the printing presses, gave them money, and, and there's no question asked. So the thing is, can we learn from the pandemic that uh, you know we need to improve? My one example would be that if you when when I saw those people walking from Delhi to Bihar, it's a very simple thing. Why couldn't they have Manrega available where they were being unemployed? Why did they have to go to their village? 
they are Indian citizens. There's no problem over that. They, 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 are, they are Indian voters. They, they are out of a job. Why can't we create an unemployment benefit for those two? So they don't have to walk all the way. And you know, then if you compare that to the non-performing assets of nationalized commercial banks, the amount of money the rich have blown and, and not paid back to, to, to banks is enormous. Whereas the poor people who are, who are kind of at, at the margin of starvation, they have to walk all the way from, from Delhi to Bihar. And I go on saying that because for me, that was the one picture which said to me, something is wrong here. You know, you know here is here are the poorest people. There are no trains available for them. There are no buses available for them. You couldn't even give them, you know, a direct benefit transfer. Nothing, nothing. They had to walk. And I think something at that stage uh, should, and I, nothing has happened subsequently. We have not reformed Manrega uh, so that urban people can also get Manrega. I don't see why not, um, because they can starve just as well as the poor people can starve. And they are voters. We know they are voters because they got an Aadhaar card. They, they can show you their Aadhaar card and say they're poor. Now, so I think. A bit of imagination is required to say, look, forget about the rules and regulations. Concentrate on the efficacy of the results. And you can, you can think about it. And don't worry too much about people cheating and so on. You know. That's not the, the real thing is people are suffering. And when they're suffering, you see it openly on your television screens. If, you know, the, the, that's the way people see it. So I think there is... There is a lot, you know, and so sort of what we get, we get detailed discussions among economists, whether the poverty level in India has gone up or gone down, and is it 15 rupees or 25 rupees, and do you, in, in what price indices you, forget about all that. Who don't live just by, by, by eating, they, they will have to life as well. I also discuss that, I say, you know, basically, the way to discuss poverty and give all poverty is, do the, people, do the poor people feel they belong to the same society as the rest? Or do they feel marginalized? Do they feel excluded? Do they feel that they have to suffer special uh, thing? Now, you know, if you, if you have non-performing assets for the rich people, i.e. they borrowed money and not paid it back, why do you insist that the poor have to, have to you know, to, to, to be well behaved? But that's the way the world is. Chandramohan, you want to go ahead, ask your question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. This is Chandramohan Joshi from Kirti College. And I thank the organizer for this opportunity. Uh, sir, you are right. Uh, when you say that developed countries and uh, the others have different interests, particularly with respect to global environmental issues. But then, yeah. sir, uh, we all know that climate change is one such menace that every country needs to fight. So what could be the way forward, particularly for India, where we have a huge size of population and, uh, and again, a good number of people are still dependent on monsoon, vagaries of monsoon. I'm talking about the small and marginal farmers. So uh, how, how can we tackle this issue of the uh, 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 issue of agricultural productivity in the light of uh, climate change? Thank well, you, sir. Yeah, yeah let, let's, let's, get, let's get this to separate questions, uh, answer separately. There are far too many small farmers in India and they shouldn't be there. Okay? I mean, basically the problem of small, the last time I looked at it, something like two thirds of farms are not viable. The reason we're there because we haven't really had sufficient industrial growth, sufficient employment generating growth. What the Green Revolution has done, it has made large farms very economical. Of course, they're getting huge subsidies in terms of power and water and all that. And as we saw from the farmers movement, they are unwilling to give up any of the privileges they have and they are mollycoddled. I'll leave that aside. Small farmers should not be there. Small farmers should be allowed, should be uh, enabled to get non-agricultural jobs near where they are, i.e. there should be a way of providing uh, 
sort of industries uh, in 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 the vicinity in, in the rural areas, but that that would be the way. So I don't think raising productivity of large farm uh, small farmers may be good, and I think there there are well known things about seeds and so on. But basically, if if you have less than half an acre, you can't actually make a living out of that. And most of the time, what the what these farming families do is that some part of the family, at the male part of the family, goes and works elsewhere. I mean, I'm sure there are surveys on that that uh, they, they they migrate to the nearest town and so on, and then they go back and give or they send money back. So small and marginal farmers have to be at, so the government ought to have a program to get them out of farming because we have more than enough food grains now. We don't need uh, small and marginal farmers because they are, they are in a very bad situation. So I would, if I were, luckily I'm not, if I were in charge, I would devise a program to have the small, uh, small uh, farmers to sell the land they have and get get non-agricultural jobs in rural areas if possible or migrating to urban areas. That's an old story which has been going on for a while. And I, I'm sure that uh, there are fewer people on the smaller farms. So I think that now the environmental problem is a very different problem. And I don't think we should say, oh, you know, we can't raise the productivity of small farmers because of environment. That's not the case. So let's separate those two questions. Now, in environment, I think to some extent, India has been doing some good things like the solar energy. I mean, India has has been one of the leading uh, uh, leading proponents of solar energy. The prime minister uh, has been has been interested in solar energy. I know since he was a chief minister of Gujarat, uh, and in and uh, he, he, he talked about that. So I think India can do certain things about the environment which are, which are worth doing, and it is not require the bad habits of uh, uh, of what what the developed countries have. But you know, actually, the rich the rich people in this country uh, live an American style uh, uh, sort of standard, and they they overuse. Uh, electricity, air conditioning, and all that sort of stuff. And we ought to tax it. You know, there ought to be huge tax on cars and on GST, and, and, uh, you know, GST on, on air conditioning and things like that. I mean, there, there's no reason why we should, we should treat that stuff kindly. I know they're very articulate and, and, and powerful uh, politically, but I think somebody ought to say that a really green Green economic policy would really seriously tax, uh, you know, the kind of urban housing. I mean, every day I see uh, houses being advertised in Goregaon uh, and, and parts of Delhi and so on. Since I'm in Delhi right now, I mean, it's people are getting away all sorts of environmentally damaging things for free almost. So I think the tax policy could be much tougher. No, I'm I'm a I'm a high tax person. I've never ever want to cut any taxes, but I think we ought to have serious high taxation on certain consumer goods, which which the people are consuming. And I don't think we should we should sort of relent on that. And GST, I think, is a great great uh, weapon to to do that. Mr. Atish uh, Nikam, can you go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Atish Nikam from Ruya College, and uh, I must uh, say this is, uh, you know, indeed a pleasure uh, for all of us to hear uh, Lord Mignad Desai over here. Uh, uh, my small question is, sir. Uh, I mean, we all know uh, and we all are aware that, uh, you know, developing countries or advanced countries, for that matter, all of them are uh, going debt ridden. Right. And uh, uh, that is a growing concern, concern at, at uh, international level. Uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, uh, as per the latest update, I, I think uh, in G today's G20 finance meeting, uh, which is uh, held in India, I believe, uh, uh, Janet Yellen ended up saying that we have to have uh, uh, some kind of a faster fixes to, uh, you know, 
get away with these uh, that crisis so uh, how do you see uh, the debt burden increasing debt burden on on uh, developing economies and advanced economies uh, having this particular problem how are we going to uh, you know meet the objective of uplifting the poor and reducing the gap and yeah, reducing yeah. The Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, it's basically a lot of the uh, debt burden is a result of the pandemic. A number of the economies, not almost all economies, had a problem, and I actually start with that uh, thing. In economics, it's very seldom that both demand and supply collapse at the same time. You know because. The Keynesian policy is that uh, you know demand has uh, uh, supply is there, but they can't sell because there is no demand. So you do the multiplier, and, and you you get uh, demand going, and then the demand uh, multiplies and all that. And if if you if you have if you have supply side problem, then you can uh, you you can give supply side incentives and so on. So countries basically. Printed money or borrowed money or whatever it is, and uh, they didn't worry about the repayment because they thought, well, we need all these things to live. Now, it's the same situation in rich countries. They have uh, a huge debt GDP ratio and so on, and how it would be uh, it would be solved. Some countries like Sri Lanka, for example. Also adopted quite completely irrational policy. Sri Lanka has a crazy policy about fertilizer imports and so on, and wrecked its agriculture. Uh, Pakistan borrowed far too much. Uh, China is a is a great lender, but a very tough uh, tough recollector of money. And as a money lender, it's as bad as a you know the pro, uh, proverbial rural money lenders of, of India. So. So I think a lot of lot of uh, countries, the uh, developing countries, borrowed quite a lot during the pandemic, and the global institutions, World Bank and IMF, have been unable to fashion a completely debt forgiveness plan. Partly because I don't think the rich countries can afford it because they themselves are in debt. So. In, there is a problem, and I think somebody some, at the G20 or G40 or whatever it is. I don't think you know. I don't actually believe that these G20s are any use. But anyway, uh, this G20 or whatever it is may be able to devise a, a debt forgiveness plan. If they can do that, uh, and say or translate it in terms of the fact that IMF and World Bank will raise money somehow or print SDRs, whatever it is, to pay the creditors over a long period of time in the future. If somebody can fashion that, then that will relieve uh, the problem. I think ultimately this bank, when a country goes bankrupt, a country goes bankrupt, you can't, you can't possess the country uh, and things like that. So there will be distress, but some policy, some some solution that we found, which would be to give the bankrupt country more money to to tide over its difficult times. But so far, in the global scene, nobody has proposed a plan. There are big plans for sustainable environment, economic growth, and all that. You know, the, the climate change oriented uh, uh, policies about lending money and so on. But nobody has found yet a policy of the distressed emerging economies or poor economies who are indebted and, and are going to go bankrupt. But then if a country goes bankrupt, what can you do? You, you, can't, you can't occupy the country militarily. Uh, so it's a, it's a problem that will have to be solved, but I don't think the world is ready yet. I don't think it's going to be solved in India at, at the G20. I think it will take a bit more time because there has been no proposal on the on the table. Okay. So, Lord Desai, we have passed the scheduled time. Now, Prashant has a request. Prashant and team have come up with a video about the academy. I think he wants to play it, maybe get your feedback, get uh, feedback from Varsha and Aditi. Is that okay? And then yeah. we can uh, 
we can ask aditi to do a vote of thanks and okay yeah prashant go ahead yes sir what is it is it a question no 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 it's a video about the academy that these students the prashant and team have made they just want your feedback will i be able to see it will i be able to see it yeah he's he's casting his screen you should be able to see it and hear okay as the world summons determination to practice true sustainability at mba we are introducing courses that will create thought leaders to drive this result at mda we lead you there to make you find your place where you have to belong our courses are designed to make you global leaders in this new era of global advancement in the field of economics finance data science and now sustainability elective esg i am mahima soni i currently work at deloitte india the courses at meghna desai helped me tremendously in my current role in the financial advisory hi i'm spandu i'm currently working as a consultant in ey india i'm thankful to mbe for giving me the opportunity to feel in my role despite being from an engineering background hi i'm priyanshi desai and i got the opportunity to work in the economic space at deloitte india by getting placed at meghna desai academy Hi, I'm Arsh Mogre and I currently work as an economist at Quantico Research. The macroeconomics course at Meghna Desai Academy for Economics better provided me an understanding of the nuances of the global economic system. MDAE has placed their alumni at the most reputed organizations. They have also led their students for further education at the world's best international universities. Continuous innovation and improvisation is a necessary ingredient of academic training. They lie at the core of our teaching of economics, finance and data science. In line with this tenet, we are soon launching a new course in sustainability, environmental social governance. At MDAE, you will immediately notice a change in the thought process and learning. Our expert faculty and their teaching methods of excellence that provide our students with the academic rigor and applied skills to meet the needs of a dynamic and globalized workplace with an obvious scarcity of postgrad programs that synergize strong theoretical skills with applied skills for a rapidly globalizing economy MDAE has ensured top in house and reputed visiting faculty that deliver a more practical education in a friendly and more approachable manner which helps students to develop a new toolkit to analyze and address real world situations my name is abane motu i'm currently a visiting professor at the meghna desai academy of economics i have 35 years of teaching and research experience in universities in the united kingdom cambridge harvard uh, lse warwick and I've, i've been a professor of economics for 20 years and been the head of economics at warwick I'm Tithanka Patnaik. I'm the chief economist at the National Stock Exchange. I teach macroeconomics at Meghna Desai Academy of Economics. I'm Dr. Bhagyashri Dabke. I'm a program coordinator at MDAE. If students have any concerns, they come to me and I see them through as I enjoy mingling with students. The Meghna Desai Academy of Economics is special because the courses are informed by the best education in the world. the content and structure informed by teaching at LSE Cambridge Harvard and Warwick You may feel very challenged and stretched to the limits of your capacity but in the end you will be amply rewarded with a bright career prospect MBA courses are designed to empower our students in the science of economics finance and data a new sustainability and esg course will create leaders who will have a global impact at mda we try to inculcate the following value in our students we think therefore we are at mda the focus of the academy is to address the widening gap between what the market needs and what traditional colleges offer 
We offer a postgraduate diploma course in economics with specializations in data analytics, finance or public policy. We also offer a one-year full-time postgraduate diploma course in data science and finance. Being a very first in India, MDAE further aims to add sustainability as a fourth education pillar to the academy's existing pillars of studies. Hence, a sustainability elective environmental, social, and governance or an ESG course as postgraduate diploma in economics program will be available from the academic year 2023 to 2024. Due to the ever-rising demand of the climate change landscape, the elective course aims to provide students with the understanding and tools to manage the rapid changes in the environmental, social and governance aspect. The course aims to create leaders that will create a global impact in this regard. At MDA, we encourage our students to think, express, an idea. Our objective is to enable our students to find their rightful position in the contemporary knowledge economy. MDA has given me the opportunity to study a wide array of subjects and also interact with a lot of industry experts. I always found coding to be difficult. MDA by giving real life examples helped me understand coding very well. We recently had Ernst & Young come on our campus for campus placements and I was among the five people who got selected for the same. It is a great opportunity because Ernst & Young is a big four and it was my dream job to work there. MDA was my shot at combining my finance background with my love for coding. Center for Monitoring Indian Economy is the biggest firm which provides economic data for Indian economy and working at such place was my dream. We want our students to be and our students deserve to be critical independent thinkers, not just followers. The Meghnad Desai Academy of Economics. Let us take you where you belong. Connect with us today. Okay, okay, thanks Prashant and thanks everybody for your uh, patience. Thank you very uh, much. How did you find it? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wonder if I could have admit you to make that this academy when I was a student. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, so it, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good advertisement. Thank you very much. And thank you for arranging this thing with Ria College. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, uh, Aditi, you want to go yeah, ahead? And yeah, do yes, sir, yes, yes, yes. Indeed, it is my great pleasure to thank Lord Meghna Desai for uh, taking out his uh, time. It, it was really difficult for him. I know it very well. And really special thanks to Lord Desai for uh, delivering this talk. And my association with uh, the Meghna Desai Academy has been pretty very long, right from its inception and its, uh, you know, first year. So it was again very uh, interesting to get associated with. And uh, thanks to Professor Amlish, prof thanks to Professor Dapke, Madam, uh, who has been a very good friend for uh, quite a long time. And uh, thank you everyone who helped and cooperated in putting up this effort today. Thank you so much. Thank you.